Hi everyone, this is Angela from the Kakana Public Library. Thanks so much for tuning in for our first day of Chapter Chats. Every day, Monday through Thursday, now through the end of June, we'll be reading a few chapters every day at 1230 of some of our favorite children's books. Today, we are starting The Wild Robot by Peter Brown. So as we go through, I'll show you the pages and the pictures in the book. We're at Thousand Islands today, so we'll also be able to look around and watch the river and the critters exploring Thousand Islands. The Wild Robot is written and illustrated by Peter Brown. The dedication of the book reads, To the Robots of the Future. Chapter 1, The Ocean. Our story begins on the ocean, with wind and rain and thunder and lightning and waves. A hurricane roared and raged through the night, and in the middle of the chaos, a cargo ship was sinking, down, down, down to the ocean floor. The ship left hundreds of crates floating on the surface, but as the hurricane thrashed and swirled and knocked them around, the crates also began sinking into the depths. One after another, they were swallowed up by the waves until only five crates remained. By morning, the hurricane was gone. There were no clouds, no ships, no land in sight. There was only calm water and clear skies and those five crates lazily bobbing along an ocean current. Days passed and then a smudge of green appeared on the horizon. As the crates drifted closer, the soft green shapes slowly sharpened into the hard edges of a wild, rocky island. The first crate rode to shore on a tumbling, rumbling wave and then crashed against the rocks with such force that the whole thing burst open. Now, reader, what I haven't mentioned is that tightly packed inside of each crate was a brand new robot. The cargo ship had been transporting hundreds of them before it was swept up in the storm. Now only five robots were left. Actually, only four robots were left, But when that, because when that first robot crashed against the rocks, the robot inside shattered to pieces. The same thing happened to the next crate. It crashed against the rocks, and the robot parts flew everywhere. Then it happened to the next one. And the next, robot limbs and torsos were flung onto ledges. A robot head splashed into a tide pool. A robot foot scattered into the waves. And then came the last crate. It followed the same path as the others, but instead of crashing against the rocks, it sloshed against the remains of the first four crates. Soon, more waves were heaving it up out of the water. It soared through the air, spinning and glistening until it slammed down onto the tall shelf of rock. The crate was cracked and crumbled, but the robot inside was safe. Chapter 2. The Otters The island's northern shore had become something of a robot gravesite. Scattered across the rocks were the broken bodies of four robots. They sparkled in the early morning light and their sparkles caught the attention of some very curious creatures. A gang of sea otters was romping through the shallows when one of them noticed the sparkling objects. The otters all froze. They raised their noses to the wind, but they smelled only the sea. So they cautiously crept over the rock to take a closer look. The gang slowly approached a robot torso. The biggest otter stuck out his paw, swatted the heavy thing, and quickly jumped back. But nothing happened. So they wriggled over to a robot hand. Another brave otter stuck out her paw and flipped the hand over. It made a lovely clinking sound on the rock, and the otters squealed with delight. They spread out and played with robot arms and legs and feet. More hands were flipped. One of the otters discovered a robot head in a tide pool, and they all drove in and took turns rolling it along the bottom. And then they spotted something else. Overlooking the gravesite was the one surviving crate. Its sides were scraped and damaged, and a wide gash ran across its top. The otters scampered up the rocks and climbed onto the big box. Ten furry faces poked through the gash, eager to see what was inside. What they saw was another brand new robot. 
but this robot was different from the others. It was still in one piece, and it was surrounded by spongy packing foam. The otters reached through the gash and tore at the foam. It was so soft and squishy. They squealed as they snatched at the fluffy stuff, shreds of it floating away on the sea breeze. And in all the excitement, one of their paws accidentally slapped an important little button on the back of the robot's head. Click! It took a while for the otters to realize that something was happening inside the crate. But a moment later, they heard it. A low, whirling sound. Everyone stopped and stared. And then the robot opened her eyes. Chapter 3. The Robot The robot's computer brain booted up. Her programs began coming online. And then, still packed in her crate, she automatically started to speak. Hello, I'm Rosam, Unit 7134, but you may call me Roz. While my robotic systems are activating, I will tell you about myself. Once fully activated, I will be able to move and communicate and learn. Simply give me a task and I will complete it. Over time, I will find better ways to complete my tasks. I will become a better robot. When I am not needed, I will stay out of the way and keep myself in good working order. Thank you for your time. I am now fully activated. Chapter 4. The Robot Hatches As you might know, robots don't really feel emotions, not the way animals do. And yet, as she sat in her crumpled crate, Roz felt something like curiosity. She was curious about the warm ball of light shining down from above. So her computer brain went to work, and she identified the light. It was the sun. The robot felt her body absorbing the sun's energy. With each passing minute, she felt more awake. When her battery was good and full, Roz looked around and realized that she was packaged inside a crate. She tried to move her arms, but they were restrained by cords. So she applied more force. The motors in her arms hummed a little louder, and the cords snapped. Then she lifted her hands and pulled apart the crate. Like a hatchling breaking from a shell, Roz climbed out into the world. Chapter 5. The Robot Gravesite Those otters were now hiding behind a rock. Their round heads nervously poked out, and they watched as a sparkling monster emerged from the crate. The monster slowly turned her head as she scanned the coastline. Her head turned and turned all the way around, and it didn't stop turning until till she was looking right at the otters. Hello, otters. My name is Raz. The robot's voice was simply too much for the skittish creatures. The biggest otter squeaked, and the whole gang suddenly took off. They galloped back across the robot graveyard, flopped into the ocean, and raced through the the waves just as fast as they could. Roz watched the otters go, but her eyes lingered on the sparkling objects that littered the shore. The objects looked strangely familiar. The robot swung her left leg forward, then her right, and just like that, she was taking her first steps. She stomped away from her crate and over the rocks and through the gravesite until she was standing above a broken robot body. She leaned in and noticed the word Rosum lightly etched on the torso. She noticed the same word on all the torsos, including her own. Roz continued exploring the gravesite until a playful little ocean wave washed over the rocks. She automatically stepped away from it. Then a bigger wave sloshed toward her, and she stepped away again. And then a gigantic wave crashed over the rocks and engulfed the entire gravesite. Heavy water pounded her against her body and knocked her to the ground, and her damaged sensors flared for the first time. A moment later, the wave was gone, and Roz lay there dripping and dented and surrounded by dead robots. She could feel her survival instincts, the part of her computer brain that made her want to avoid danger and take care of herself so she could continue functioning properly. Her instincts were urging her to move away from the ocean. She carefully got to her feet and saw that high above the shore, the land was bursting with trees and grasses and flowers. It looked lush and safe up there. It looked like a much better place for our robot. She had just one problem. To get up there, she would have to climb the sea cliff. Chapter 6. The Climb 
crack, thunk, clang. Roz was having a little trouble climbing the cliffs. She had a new dent in her rear and a long scrape down her side. And she was just about to get another ding when a crab scuttled out from under a piece of driftwood. The crab looked up and immediately showed off his giant claws. Everyone was afraid of his claws, but not the robot. She just looked down and introduced herself. Hello, crab. My name is Roz. After a brief standoff, the crab cautiously backed away, and that's when Roz noticed how easily he moved over the rocks. With his wide stance and his grippy feet, the crab could crawl up and down any rock face. So Roz decided to try out her climbing technique. She spread her arms wide and clamped each of her hands onto the cliffside. She jammed one foot into a crack and lifted her other foot onto a narrow ledge, and just like that, she was climbing. Roz moved awkwardly at first. A chunk of rock crumpled in her hand, and she had trouble finding footholds. But as she climbed higher and higher, she started to get the hang of it. Seagulls squawked from their cliff nests and soared away when the robot came too close, but Roz paid them no mind. She was focused only on getting to the top. Up and up and up she went, methodically climbing past nests and ledges and tiny trees rooted in the cracks, and before long, a robot felt the soft soil of the island beneath her feet. Chapter 7. The Wilderness Animal sounds filled the forest, chirps and wing beats and rustling in the underbrush. And then, from the sea cliffs, there came new sounds, heavy, crunching footsteps. The forest animals fell silent, and from their hiding places, they watched as a sparkling monster stomped past. But the forest was not a comfortable place for Roz. Jagged rocks and fallen trees and tangled underbrush made it difficult for her to walk. She stumbled along, struggling to keep her balance until her foot snagged and she toppled over like a piece of timber. It wasn't a bad fall, no dings, no dents, just dirt, but Roz was programmed to keep herself in good working order, and once she was back on her feet, she immediately began cleaning herself off. Her hands darted around her body, quickly brushing and picking off every speck of dirt. Only when the robot was sparkling again did she continue through the forest. Roz stumbled on until she found a patch of ground that was flat and open and carpeted like with pine needles. It seemed like a safe place, and safety was all the robot really wanted. So she stood there, motionless, all perfect lines and angles set against the irregular shapes of the wilderness. Chapter 8. The Pine Cones If you stand in a forest long enough, eventually something will fall on you and Roz had been standing in the forest long enough. A gentle wind whispered through the tree traps, and then, thunk, a pine cone bounced off her head. The robot looked down and watched the pine cone roll to a stop. It seemed harmless, so Roz went right back to doing nothing. A few hours later, a gust of wind rushed through the treetops, and then, thunk, the robot looked down as another pine cone rolled by. And then a few hours after that, a howling wind tore through the treetops. It bent trunks and shook branches, and then thunk, 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 pine cones began raining down. Thunk, thunk, Roz felt something like annoyance. Thunk, she quickly, quickly scanned the area for somewhere safe from pine cones, and she spotted the perfect place when she looked up at the huge, rocky shape that towered above the forest. Chapter 9 The Mountain Roz was now stomping her way up the mountain. Dense forest and rocky outcrops forced the robot to zig and zag and backtrack, but after an hour of steady hiking, she arrived at the craggy mountain peak. Grasses and flowers and shrubs sprouted from every pocket of soil, but there were no trees on the top. Roz was safe from those annoying pine cones. She dusted herself off and then carefully climbed up a leaning slab of stone to the very highest point of the entire mountain. The robot slowly turned her head completely around. She saw the ocean stretching to the horizon in every direction. And in that moment, Roz learned what you and I have known since the beginning of the story. In that moment, Roz finally realized that she was on an island. Roz looked down and surveyed the island. 
Starting from the sandy southern point, the island grew wider and greener and hillier until it finally jutted up into the rocky cone of the mountain. In some places, the mountain fell away, leaving sheer cliffs. A waterfall rushed off one cliff and fed a river that wound its way through a great meadow in the center of the island. The river flowed past wildflowers and ponds and boulders and then disappeared into the forest. Blurry shapes suddenly cut through the robot's vision. She fo refocused her eyes and saw vultures circling above the foothills. Then she noticed lizards warming themselves on a distant rock. A badger peeked out from a berry bush. A moose waded, th waded through a stream. A flock of sparrows turned in perfect unison above the trees. The island was teeming with life. And now it had a new kind of life, a strange kind of life, artificial life. Chapter 10, The Reminder. I should remind you, reader, that Roz had no idea how she had come to be on that island. She didn't know that she'd been built in a factory and then stored in a warehouse before crossing the ocean on a cargo ship. She didn't know that a hurricane had sunk the ship and left her crate floating on the waves for days until it finally washed ashore. She didn't know that she'd been accidentally activated by those curious sea otters. As the robot looked out at the island, it never even occurred to her that she might not belong there. As far as Roz knew, she was home. Chapter 11. The Robot Sleeps. Roz stood on the peak and watched the sun sink behind the ocean. She watched shadows slowly spread over the ocean and up the mountainside. She watched the stars come out one by one until the sky was filled with a million points of light. It was the first night of the robot's life. She activated her headlights and suddenly bright shafts of light were beaming from her eyes and illuminating the whole mountaintop. Too bright. So she dimmed them. Then she turned them off and sat in darkness and listened to the chorus of nighttime chirps. After a while, our robot's computer brain decided it was a good time to conserve energy. So she sat and anchored her hands to the rocks. Her non-essential program switched off, and then in her own way, the robot slept. Chapter 12. The Storm Roz felt safe up on the mountaintop, so she spent the next few days and nights perched on the peak. But everything changed one afternoon when a low flying cloud crept up the mountain and Roz found herself surrounded by white. When the world, world faded back into view, she noticed more clouds floating south past the island. Then she heard a deep rumble behind her. The robot turned her head around and saw that the sky was filled with a swirling wall of darkness. Light flickered here and there, more deep rumbles. A storm was approaching, and it wasn't just any storm. It was as fierce as the one that had sent the cargo ship to the ocean floor. The wind picked up, and the first drops of rain tapped against the robot. It was time to go. Roz unclamped her hands and began sliding down the peak. Hot sparks flew from where her body scraped against the leaning slab of stone. As soon as her feet hit the soil, she was off and running. The rain fell harder. The wind blew faster. The lightning flashed brighter. The thunder cracked louder. So much rainwater was falling that rushing rivers of runoff started springing up everywhere. Roz splashed through the mountains, searching for the through the gloom for any kind of shelter. But she should have watched where she was going. Her heavy feet slipped and tripped, and she tumbled right into a mudslide. Our robot was helpless. The river of mud whisked her downhill, slammed her into rocks, and dragged her through bushes and sweeping her straight toward the cliff. Mud was pouring off the cliff like a waterfall. Roz frantically clawed at the ground, grasping for anything she could hold on to, but the flow only carried her faster toward the edge. And just as she was about to plunge over the side, she came to a hard, sudden stop. Mud surged around her, spraying into her face, pinning her against something solid. She blindly felt with her hands and recognized the thick roots and trunk of a pine tree. In an instant, she was pulling herself up into the branches. The wind whipped across the mountainside, and Roz heard the familiar thunk 
of pine cones pelting her body, but she didn't mind. She was just happy to be safe from the mud flow. The robot locked her arms and legs around the tree and waited for the storm to blow over. Chapter 13, The Aftermath Daybreak and the storm had passed, but the sounds of water were everywhere. The air was filled with the dripping sounds of mounted runoff and the sloshing sounds of flooded streams. And then came a different sound. It was the clanging sound made when a robot slips on a wet rock. There were quite a few clangs that morning. As Roz worked her way downhill, she scanned the aftermath of the storm. Giant mounds of mud and debris had formed below the cliffs. The island's center river had crested its banks and filled into nearby fields and forests. Some trees had been uprooted. Others were submerged. Their upper branches barely poked above the rainwater, their lower branches swarming with fish instead of birds. After such a storm, you might expect to see animal corpses scattered along all the devastation, but the animals seemed to have survived just fine. Somehow, they had known the storm was coming, and they had found shelter long before it rolled in. Lowland creatures who had sought refuge on higher grounds were waiting patiently for the water to recede. Deer were wading through the flooded fields. Beavers were busy collecting a trove of fallen branches. Geese honked in the sky before splashing down into a watery section of the forest. Clearly, the animals were experts at survival. Clearly, the robot was not. Roz was crusted in mud and grit, so she gave herself another good cleaning, but that only revealed her dents and scratches. They were really starting to add up. She hardly resembled the perfect robot who had appeared on the shore just a week earlier. The wilderness was taking a toll on poor Roz, so she felt something like relief when she spotted the quiet hole in the side of the mountain. It looked like a safe space for a robot. She stomped across the hillside and up to the cave, but never stopped to wander, wonder what might be lurking within. Chapter 14. The Bears Roz stomped into the cave, and then she stomped right back out. Please stay away, said the robot to the two bears who were now nipping at her heels. You see, when Roz stomped into the cave, she accidentally woke a brother and sister bear from their morning nap, which is never a good idea. And, it make, and to make matters worse, bears have an instinct that drives them to attack when a creature runs away, especially if the creature runs away in a mysterious, sparkling monster. So as the startled bears watched Roz stomping out of their cave, they really had no choice at all. They simply had to take up the chase. Roz tried her best to outrun the bears. She leaped over rocks and wove through trees and stomped across the mountainside at full speed. But the bears were young and strong and fast, and the robot still had so much to learn about moving through the wilderness. She never even saw the tree root. One moment, she was stomping along, and the next, she was flying through the air and thumping down onto a rotten log. Clumps of st soft wood stuck to her side, and she stood and faced her attackers. Wouldn't you be afraid if two bears were charging toward you? Of course you would. Everyone would. Even the robot felt something like fear. Roz was programmed to take care of herself. She was programmed to stay alive. And as a robot watched those bears charging toward her, she knew her life was in serious danger. The bears slammed into Roz, knocking her against the trunk of a towering tree. Then one bear dove at her legs and the other clawed at her chest. If only the robot had swung her fists or kicked her feet, she could have scared them off. One good bop on the nose would have sent them running, but the robot's programming would not allow her to be violent. Clearly, Roz was not designed to fight bears. Powerful claws chomped her arms. Ch sharp claws slashed her face. A massive head rammed into her chest. Please stay away, said the robot. Rawr, said the sister bear. Grrr, said the brother bear. And then the bears went in for the kill. But the robot had vanished. Chapter 15. The Escape Using all the strength in her legs, Roz jumped straight up high into the air and landed on a tree branch overhead. The tree shook with the sudden weight of the robot and then, thunk, thunk, two pine cones bounced off Roz and a moment later, thunk, 
Thunk, the same pine cones bounced off the bears' heads below. The bears grunted with annoyance. This gave Roz an idea. The robot's programming stopped her from being violent, but nothing stopped her from being annoying. So Roz plucked pine cones from the nearby branches and lobbed them down at the bears. Thunk, 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 thunk. Each pine cone bounced off its target with annoying accuracy and whipped the young bears into a frenzy. Rawr, said the sister bear. Grrr, said the brother bear. I do not understand you, bears, said the robot. Roz was about to unload a whole armful of annoying pine cones when a distant roar echoed through the forest. Back at the cave, the mother bear was calling for these two, and she did not sound happy. The young bears looked at each other. They knew they were in trouble. But before lumbering home, they glared up at Roz and snorted one last time. More than anything, they wanted to kill the robot. Chapter 16 the pine tree. Roz was in no hurry to leave the tree. She stayed on her branch long after the bears had gone, enjoying some peace and looking herself over. In addition to bite marks and claw marks, the robot was also covered in dirt, which, of course, meant it was time for another cleaning. She was making good progress when she felt something sticky on her arm. The problem with sitting in a pine tree is that, eventually, the tree's sticky residue will find you. It always does and it found Roz. The robot scrubbed and scraped at the resin, and soon her fingers were completely coated in the sticky stuff. Then it was all over her arms and her legs and her torso, and things were about to get even worse. A robin swooped into the tree and began screeching and fluttering around Roz. The bird had recently finished building herself a new nest. It was a little work of art, a delicate woven basket from grasses and twigs and feathers, and it was right above the robot, robot's head. Screech, screech, said the robin. I do not understand you, robin, said the robot. The robin continued screeching and fluttering, and then, splat, she splattered her droppings and crossed the robot's face. This bird was serious. So Roz scooted away, further out on the branch, until she heard a quick, sharp crack. Before Roz knew what was happening, the tree branch snapped under her weight and she went crashing to the forest floor. She hit the ground hard and lay there as branches broke and pine cones and needles showered down on top of her. There was another splat and then quiet returned to the forest. Wow. What an adventure our robot friend has had already. I hope you enjoyed our first day of chapter chat. I challenge you this afternoon, before we meet again to continue our story tomorrow, to draw a picture of what you think the island looks like. If you go back in this recording and listen to chapter 9, The Mountain, we learn more about what Roz sees from the top of the mountain. If you'd like, share your picture of your island drawing with the library on Facebook. Until then, have a great day, and I hope to see you tomorrow.